there, fellow marketers. Professor Walters here, and today we're here outside the Volcano National Park here in Rwanda. Actually, if you look over my right shoulder, you might see the volcanoes, one of them peeking through the clouds. It is gorgeous here. And as I've been here in Rwanda, I've seen Coke, and I've seen Pepsi, and I've seen, you know, Skull beer, a Brazilian beer. I've seen Jeeps and stuff like that. I've seen products from all over the world here in Rwanda that aren't necessarily made here. And it got me thinking, hey, how is it that companies decide how they should go abroad? Like, what is their global market entry strategy? Like, do, do we export our products, just make it at home and send it there? Or, or do I franchise it out or lease it? Or do we set up a joint venture together? Or, or do I direct invest and put all my money in one spot and take care of all the control? It really got me thinking, seeing all these things. And so today what this video is about is some of the more common ways that companies do go global, okay? How do I get my products in a foreign market. And a lot of that will depend on how much control companies want to have, right? I mean, if you're a tech company or a pharmaceutical company, you want to have all the control possible because you don't want to lose your secrets, right? Versus the amount of risk they're willing to take. So the more you're investing in that other country, the more money you're spending, right? The more risk you're taking on, okay? So these two kind of facets are really important when you're looking to go abroad, all right? So what we're going to go through is we're going to go through five or six different market entry strategies, well, global market entry strategies, in this video to give you an idea of some of the advantages and disadvantages of each one and see how certain companies use them to their advantage because sometimes just exporting your product is fine other times i need to have my boots on the ground i need to have my own stuff there my own people there and companies have to make those decisions now the first way that most companies go abroad and probably the most popular way companies go abroad definitely usually the first way they go abroad is exporting that's when you use your current production facilities in your home market and you make your product there and then you just ship it to another country so jeep they might be making their products in the u.s and then they ship their jeeps here to rwanda so when we go on our cool jeep tours here and our open top safari things we can have a great time here but they're not making it here they're just exporting it to here in rwanda now the advantages of actually actually exporting one thing is you already have the production facilities so you don't have to spend any money on that so that makes it lower risk is lower money therefore we already have our, our learning curves we've already learned all these things there also what's cool about exporting is what's the worst case scenario with our exports if it's on a ship and the ship sinks we're only out the money of the jeeps that sank with the ship right so there's no other kind of risk involved that's why this is the least amount of risk this is why a lot of companies do it at first like i just want to test out globally so i'll just send some of my products over to that country okay so you have that now the thing is since a lot of companies start off with this you're like well why do they stop well there are some disadvantages to it i mean think about it one thing is if i'm just shipping it to that market i'm shipping 100 jeeps to rwanda what happens if tourism just booms here in rwanda as it should because this place is awesome and they needed 200 jeeps well, we can't make any more money. Our return on investment's limited to what we sent over there. I can't take advantage of when my, my product gets popular or anything like that, because it's limited. Also, it's a little more difficult for me to earn scale economies when I'm exporting, because I'm exporting such small amounts to these countries, you know, because I'm not sure if it's gonna work, so that might limit some of the things there. You're also, you're not learning about that market, so you might be missing out. Like, I didn't know, oh, here in Rwanda, you usually wanna have an eight seat Jeep because you have groups that like to go on a travel and it becomes more cost effective for the tour guide. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because you're not in the market. You're just exporting your product there. That's why when you're exporting, it's always important that you have a good distributor in that foreign market so you can learn from them. They're sharing information with you, okay? Now, the thing is, though, like I said, this one, you have the least control over your over your product because once you ship it, it's done. It's in their hands. I can't do anything. But what's cool is my financial risk is actually the least as well. So that's why a lot of companies kind of do this. Now, sometimes, though, you want to make sure you're controlling a little bit more, like, I don't want to take on a ton of risk, but I do want to have some more control. Like I want to make sure my brand isn't ruined when it goes abroad. And so what will happen is some companies will do what's called a franchising agreement or a leasing, leasing agreement or a licensing agreement. For example, last night I was here in my, my, my hotel here in Rwanda and I'm drinking Skull beer. Skull is a Brazilian beer. And what they did is they licensed it to a brewery here in Rwanda. So they're brewing it here, okay? Another one you might see is McDonald's. McDonald's has franchisees all over the world. McDonald's doesn't own every single McDonald's. That would be too expensive. They have people that invest and, and, and buy a franchise and they set up a franchise agreement and they do it for them, okay? So what's cool about this franchise agreement is, hey, look, 
if I'm a comp, if I'm an investor, if I'm a franchisee, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy McDonald's. I get all McDonald's secrets. I get to go to Hamburger U and learn how to make burgers and and run my stores and all this kind of stuff. And it's really kind of cool because you're sharing all this information. Also, I'm helping them set up organizational structure, marketing structure, all these kind of things. So the brand can actually work the same way in all these different countries where people don't realize is McDonald's Germany and McDonald's you know U.S. McDonald's China are all different companies, but they're all kind of doing the same thing. So we're all kind of working together. Also what helps with these franchise agreements is since those franchisees, the ones that are buying a McDonald's franchise, they're investing in. So for McDonald's, it's really cool because hey, we get money from them. Also, those franchisees, most likely they know that market better, right? They know what's going on there. So they know that, hey, McDonald's will probably work here. Skull Beer will probably sell here. And so you get their kind of knowledge, which is really cool. Also, they're taking on a lot of the risk. So you, you, you have a little more risk now because you're, you're doing a little bit of stuff, but hey, it, it, it's still pretty low on the risk scale and we're looking at global expansion, right? But the thing is, is franchise agreements and franchising isn't always, you know, the best thing. You know, there are some disadvantages to it. One thing is you're limited on your control. You can only tell them to do what's in the franchise agreement. Because if you try to tell them to do something that's not in the franchise agreement, they're like, hey, sorry, we don't have to ca carry your fish nuggets because it doesn't say in the franchise agreement we have to carry fish nuggets. Okay, so that's why it's really important you have a really good franchise agreement that covers different stuff from like it McDonald's probably has it where it talks about the food they have to have, how they advertise, probably um, how clean the bathrooms are, these kind of things all go into that, all right? Also a disadvantage, you're only limited to a certain percentage of the income. So let's say McDonald's China just gets huge, it gets bigger than McDonald's America, but McDonald's Corporation is only limited to that, what, 10% or something like that, that they get from the revenue. So man, we, we could be making so much more money, but again, we're limited to what the contract says. And another issue that you might see, it doesn't happen a lot of times, but it can happen, is actually by having this franchisee, they could actually develop in that market and become bigger and more powerful than you. So you could actually develop your own competition. So, so that could be a thing. Now, sometimes companies also want to go a little bit farther. Okay, now I want to, I want to put a little bit more risk out there. I'm really, really invest a little bit more money because I want to have a little bit more control, a little bit more say in what's going on. And the next step up on the scale here is what we call a strategic alliance. This is when two companies agree to work together. Together. Two organizations agree to work together. Now, they're not investing in each other. They're not making a new company, but they're kind of like, we're agreeing to work with each other. It's kind of like, hey, we're boyfriend and girlfriend, right? Now you keep your apartment, I have my apartment, but we agree that we're dating, right? So it's kind of like that kind of feel. And I see this a lot in study abroad programs between universities. So my university and, and the v University in Vienna, they have a strategic alliance. We'll send our students to you and you send our students to us and we'll work together. Now, what's good about these things is one, hey, I'm, I'm getting to learn from that local market. They're teaching us about Vienna, but also we're teaching them about the U.S. when they're when they're studying there. And, and we're really helping each other's business, which is a really nice thing. Now, the disadvantage is this. I mean, think about it. Have you ever dated someone and, and they do things that you don't want them to do? Well, yeah, you have no contract to stop them from doing anything. It's just that we're promising to work together. I didn't write it down. We're just promising to work together. And with all that information sharing, which is a good thing, sometimes you might lose some of your intellectual property. So that could be a problem with strategic alliance. Also, if you're helping out a lot with a strategic alliance, sometimes you might be also creating a competitor and you know how things are in any friendship. A lot of times some person's giving more and other people are taking more and things like that. So you have those issues with any kind of alliance. So you had to think about those things. And so in order to kind of control better, what a lot of companies end up doing is what's called a joint venture. So joint venture, we're getting a bit more control and we're also taking on a bit more risk. And in a joint venture, the two companies, instead of just agreeing to work together, we actually financially come together. Okay, well, we maybe we set up a partnership working together, a joint venture where we're both investing our money and it's all of a sudden now things get more real. Now we're contractually linked together. It's the change from being boyfriend, girlfriend to being, you know, spouses, right? And so you have those kind of things. Like that's the next level. Like putting the ring on it, that's next level kind of stuff, right? So that's a joint venture. As your parents might say, uh, we combined our CD collection, all right? So this is like you're, you're, you're getting married, you're in married, you're living together. I mean, it's a lot more of a commitment this way, all right? And so what's cool is you're still splitting the risk and you know you try to make it a 50-50 joint venture. So we're splitting the risk e equally, the financial risk and stuff like that. We're splitting the control. We're gaining those local insights from our joint venture partner. And it really shows that we're committed to each other to work together. And another thing I should add in here though, with joint ventures is some countries actually require you to do a joint venture depending on maybe the industry 
industry you're in or the country you're going to, these kind of things, it might be required that way. Now, some of the disadvantages of those joint ventures, which you have to realize in any joint venture, it, you know, you try to make it a 50-50 split, but a lot of times you'll see is one partner will dominate the other partner. So that can be an issue there. Also, you could be losing your intellectual property because you're sharing your stuff with them. You could also eventually be creating a competitor because they're sharing so much stuff with them. So there are issues when it comes to joint ventures. That's why some companies just say, you know what, I will take all the risk because I need to have 100% control. I mean, think about it. If you have intellectual property that you cannot share, I mean, I have figured out the best algorithm ever. I've filled out, figured out the cure for cancer or something like that. I don't want any other companies knowing this. I don't want to share this information. I want to control it all myself. Well, then you know what? Maybe direct investment is going to be the best thing for you because that way you have 100% control in the new market. But with 100% control, you have 100% of the risk. You have so much more money laid out that could just collapse and be lost, okay? Because think about it, building up that supply chain network, building up the factories, building up the, the distribution networks, all this kind of stuff costs a lot more than just putting some cars on a ship and sending it abroad, okay? So you have that. But the thing that's cool is you really do maintain control of your intellectual property. That's the key thing. Also, you get to learn about that country you're in. You're learning yourself. You're getting all those learning curve effects. You can get your economies of scale in that market. So you're becoming a big part of that market. Also, it shows a commitment to the market because, hey, if they if that country sees that you're investing big money in there and you're gonna be getting jobs in there, they might be it might be more advantageous for your business in that country. But the thing is, it's not all perfect here because remember, this is one of the disadvantages is really that this is the highest financial outlay, which means this is the highest risk way of going abroad. So you gotta be careful with that. And the thing is, just because you go abroad doesn't mean you understand the market. So you're going to have to do a lot more research. You have to have a lot more time, like making sure, is this the right place for us to be? Where do we put our store? Where do you, how do we set up our distribution? Who are the important people we have to hire? And so there's a lot more mistakes that you can make when you do this, when you're not working with the locals, you know, in a joint venture or something like that. And also, like I said about the joint ventures, governments maybe like joint ventures. Sometimes governments don't like 100% owned foreign direct investment products and, and companies. So there are those issues there. But the thing is, there's lots of other ways that companies can actually go abroad. I just wanted to give you some of the basic kind of global entry strategies that are out there so you can be better prepared if you're going to be taking your international marketing exam or your, your global business exam or something like that. Or if you just want to know, hey, what are some of the different ways that companies go abroad? So I hope this helps you know a little bit more. Um, I want to say thank you for watching. A thumbs up is always appreciated. If you like business videos like this or you want to learn more, hit that subscribe button. We put up basic marketing videos, advanced marketing videos, fun business videos, YouTube training videos, all kinds of stuff. So we do appreciate it. And we'll say bye from here in Rwanda.